Welcome to the first part of our four-part growth series with Naomi Simpson. In this session, we'll be talking about the importance of customer obsession, what it means to Naomi, and how she talks about it with her various clients and businesses that she mentors. So to kick things off, how would you define customer obsession? So if we think about obsession and what it means, it's the fact that you can't give it up. You think about it over and over and over again. And we know that Jeff Bezos, for instance, always has a spare chair in the room and that represents the customer. So customer obsession is how do you make sure that you're not talking internally or what's easier for you. You're always reflecting on how would this land with our customers. A nice little trick on that is if you list the 10 things in your business that you think are the most important thing, and then ask yourself the question, are those 10 the same order for my customers? And maybe you do it against your competition as well in terms of are these unique things about my business? But you've got to think in terms of if you're a customer. Customer obsession means that you are looking at every single touch point, every interaction that you're having with your brand and it is about the brand experience but it's never done it's mm. never finished it's never fixed so it's over and over and over again which is why yeah. the word is obsession so for a lot of new business owners customer obsession is a difficult thing to manage at the start there's a lot of trade-offs they've got to keep the health of the business viable they've got to take care of their team as well and then also make sure that the customer is their first priority how does a new first-time founder or business owner manage those different priorities? Well, clearly it depends the sort of business that they're in, how big their team is, whether you know they're just doing it on their own and starting. But I always had the theory, and this is way back in the day, but I always had the theory that I couldn't do everything, no matter how much I tried as yeah. a founder, but you can't do everything. So therefore, the team, the customer experience team, moment by moment, they're creating the brand, how they speak to the customers, how they respond. So my energy needed to be with how I created the brand experience of what they were sharing. So the investment that I was making in those people, in um, sharing them, and even role playing, quite frankly. Um, and this is back in the day when you know I was at that stage in the business, but we do role playing, what's the hardest customer you've spoken mm. to, what was the most irrational. And it also gave them confidence to really be able to tackle that. So, you know, if you invest in your people, especially in that secret source of what a founder has and that energy, and you pass that to the people who are who are working with your customers or listening yeah. deeply, yeah. then that's how you create this real energy and people get the enthusiasm for the enterprise. And when you're role playing with business founders, you're talking to them about customer situations, you're talking about um, what they want to do over the next three, six, 12 months to, to grow their customer base and to make sure that they're focusing their mission around those customers. What, what kind of conversations would you include as part of that role play? So the role play that I was having was with my own team. Mm. So with the people that yeah. inside my enterprise. But when I work with founders, one thing that I really want to understand is what do they love? and what do they loathe? What yeah. do they love doing? Because some people are innately people people. You know, they yeah. love being with people, they see a room of people and can hardly wait. Yeah. But if they're only talking about themselves, of what they've got to offer, what they're trying to sell, then, you, they, then they may be missing. You know, one mouth, two ears. We should be listening deeply at every opportunity of understanding how the the story you're sharing is landing with those mm. customers. And that's one thing I do with founders because they get so excited about themselves and what they're doing and it's so important. But yeah. actually there's only one really important person that's a customer. Yeah, and what I really like about this role-playing idea and it linking it back to the customer obsession point is it's really difficult, especially for new digital businesses, to be speaking to customers every day, have that sense of it as well. So role-playing gives them a way to experiment with different conversations and prompts to see how they are responding to their customer and be really actively thinking about that process. Yeah, well, let me first pick up on yeah. something else that you were saying there in terms of how is it that when you're in a two-dimensional space, which is digital space, how do mm. you listen to customers, yes. okay? Because yes. I think that's a really, really important point yeah. because, you know, I made a sale. You yeah. don't know why exactly. or yeah. the luck. So, yeah. you know, people know the story that the very first customer that we had at Red yeah. Balloon, you know, I picked up the phone and I spoke to Damien Chown to find out his experience of the website. It wasn't mm. particularly good one yeah. by. But, you know, it never hurts to call people. Yes. Like we're still people. Yes. And, you know, when you get people to fill in an online form and say, how was the service? Would yeah. you recommend your, you know, friends with the old net promoter score? 
would just randomly pick up a f- mm. pick up the phone and speak to people. And go, just want, trying to understand what you meant by that. And the conversation with Carrie, I, you can't believe it. The founder of X called me to understand what my customer interaction was like, and they become advocates yeah. because ultimately you want customers to feel your brand, which is really hard in a two-dimensional space. So you're always looking for listening posts. So if you think about how do I create listening posts in my business, one of the reasons that I put on the red jacket and I left the office and went to events was so I could meet people, so I could feel things, so I could try ideas, so I could understand. And, you know, back in the day, we had a how was it for you survey. We still send out surveys, which are far more like uh, reviews, and we're asking people. But I used to read every single one. And then that's where I got my sense of purpose from, because I understood the impact that I was having on customers. And then I would call them and I'd go, what do you, what do you mean by that? Tell yeah, me more about yeah. it. I don't understand that. And they would, you'd surprise and delight them. And seriously, that investment in customer is really, really great. But when it comes to David and I, David is the group CEO of Big Red Group, and we have a number of brands. We have Red Balloon, Adrenaline, Lime and Tonic, and we therefore we're running an operational business, but we have brand managers now running each of those mm, brands, yeah. and they have a very different involvement. But, yes, our customer experience team sits right inside our growth team because mm. they perpetuate each other. Yeah, on your points about reviews, I think that's very interesting, saying that we've, we personally do it at Wallach, so we do a similar net promoter score with our customers. Um, but something we found really valuable is you look at the five-star reviews and they're glowing, and maybe there's some points that, to work on, but mostly they're, they're pretty good. The one-star scores, there's also a lot of you know, feedback and input as well, but sometimes it's a customer service issue, and often those ones are the ones that business owners are really aware of. What I find though, if we look at the three or four star reviews, there's often some really critical feedback in there where people are really consciously thinking. And it's very easy for someone to have a bad experience, give that one star review. Maybe there's things to work on, but those three is. So there's also course, yeah. another segment. It's the ones who never fill anything exactly. in. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So I was doing this speaking engagement a few weeks ago on customer obsession. And the question that I, I was asked is they said, you know, if, if you were going to recommend one thing we should do in our business, a really big business, um, then what, what do you think we should do around customer obsession? And I said, it's the people who don't feel anything. You have a much mm. better ability to move them into obsession, yeah. moving them into advocacy, yeah. into being ambassadors or maybe referring a friend, yes. than you do with the negative people. And then I gave them the example of this particular brand, which I'd been a customer of for 25 years. But then when I um, remarried um, and I left it to my husband to choose, well, what are we going to do now in this particular space? And he chose the one he'd been with for 25 years. So I just wandered off. It wasn't that I was angry. It wasn't that I was upset. But what disappointed me was after 25 years of being with that brand, not so much as a phone call, let alone even not even an email to say, wow, we're sorry to see you go. What -hmm. happened? So there's insight within the great untouched. In fact, there's more opportunity in there. And if they had have stamped their feet and said, no, you're important to us, we might have well come back. You know, all of us as individuals, you think about it yourself. Where do you love to get your coffee? It's the person who looks at you in the eye and remembers your name. You know, so so that's what we're trying to experience is this sense of emotional connection to a brand. And you can create incredible opportunity in the nothingness of it was just a transaction or it was easy. Yeah, and with our theme of choose growth, I think there's a big focus on new customer acquisition. We've always got to meet the next month's target by acquiring these customers. And I think it's very easy to forget your existing cohort and who are those customers that you can grow more from. And um, you've already got that existing relationship, so it makes a lot of sense to leverage it. Um, we talked, you mentioned referrals, and I wanted to touch on that because I think that's such an interesting um, point and, and so powerful, especially for newer businesses. Um, Red Balloon was pretty early in terms of their referral program at the very start, as I understand. How did you think about bringing that into motion at the very start? It was there on day one. Uh, And also, so was the feedback loop. And it was literally an email call. How was it for you? It's called something Mm, else now. But it was there from day one. And that was because I had no idea. Like everybody kept telling me it was a great idea, but I had no idea. And the fact that I launched something 
into the ether in a two-dimensional space. And I'm used to being with people, clearly. I'm a people yep. person. Yep. 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 And so it was just this, nothing happened, and I couldn't stand it. So the referral just meant so obvious. And the other thing is, even just in the in the final step, is take a friend, you know. Don't go on your experience yep. on your own. Just make it really easy for people to take a friend, and it, it, it makes sense. So the wonderful thing, and when I look at people's business models, you know, they present to me or whatever, yep. Yep. and they come up with a business model, I'm always thinking, is this a friend get friend? So if you know, you know, of course, the story. If you invent a telephone, it's absolutely useless and there's this and else yeah. at the end of that other. So Red Balloon, nobody knew about it. The number one way we found customers was when they were given one and it worked. So the experience of the experience and making sure everything lined up and people literally said, it was just so easy. And I go, yeah. So we worked on that customer journey on making it absolutely frictionless and we still do. We invest greatly in what they call user journey. Um, but the the notion that when you get one of those red, red, red envelopes, it's like, now what do I do? And so every time we, 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 would, every time we ran a campaign um, at Christmas, we'd have this step change. So when I'm looking at a business model, I'm saying, what would be the natural and obvious reason of why you would refer it to a friend? And it's not about, did I get a 5% discount off my next order? It's because if you do it together, it's better. Mm, yeah, absolutely. For experiences as well, it makes so much sense. Of course. It aligns, aligns yeah. well with your But that, that works for other yeah. business models yeah. as well. So how do founders or new business owners focus or focus their attention in on growth? Well, I can hear growth going on in Sydney right now. Yes. <laughs> I can hear that. Look, the thing is you do need to focus on growth. Growth doesn't happen by accident. And sometimes founders, especially in that startup phase when they're getting a few customers, they think it's just going to continue. So one of the things that I did way back in the day, and with all of my Shark Tank businesses, all of them, I always focus on this one critical thing. One is, why do we do what we do? Mm. So what is our purpose? But then what is the scorecard around that? What is our audacious goal? And have we got a scorecard that says that? So, for instance, uh, with one of the companies I work with, with um, Cell, it's how many pairs did we deliver? Because you know you're impacting that number of people with the outcome. Um, for, the, uh, for Red Balloon, for the Red Balloon business, it's about the number of experiences that were served. And obviously, everyone has a dollar value. There's an average transaction mm. price. Yeah, yeah. But also, I know that for every one of those, at least two people have got to know the brand and then it, the story is going to perpetuate. So I always look at what would be the number that is inspiring and aspirational, so inspiration and aspiration, yep. and what is that? So there's a few kind of really critical growth numbers. I always look in a business at what is the cost to acquire a customer and what is the lifetime value of that customer? Because if the cost to acquire is more yeah. than the margin, it's not a sustainable model. There is a notion that more than 50% of VC funds in the US are currently going to Google and Facebook in the cost of acquiring customers. That is not sustainable as a business model. There has to be another way, back to our previous point about customer get customer referral and so forth. So the first one I look at is cost to acquire, which it also includes the lifetime value. I'm also looking at the performance of the website itself. So in other words, what's the, um, what we call conversion rate and on what particular um, medium? So also as a larger enterprise is the revenue per employee. And that's really important as well because you're looking for scale. Any enterprise I'm working with, I'm looking at if I add more money, can they grow more? Is that the, the limitation? But yep. there's certain metrics which will help me understand if they're going to be successful. And as you monitor that over time, I can imagine you can see, okay, this business is very successful at this size, but once we start to grow up further, we need to find other ways to make it more efficient, right? Exactly, and what are the breakpoints? Which is why revenue per employee is really mm. important because when you start a business, you're all generalists. You all have to do everything, you know, answer the phones, ship the product, do everything. But at some point you want specialists. You want people who are, have bring unique specialist skills to those particular roles. So it's very important that you make that transition and that you understand, though, that these specialists are adding incremental value. And that's, that's growing pains and it can be really hard for founders. Absolutely. And you mentioned 
setting a really audacious goal around one key metric, such as how many pairs are we able to sell, like how many pairs are we able to deliver, I think it was. How do businesses or how do founders focus on what that metric should be? Is it for an e-commerce business, is it normally tied to getting their good out the door? Is there other ones that you've seen that are particularly effective? It actually reminds me of Swish.com, which was um, on my podcast because she asked, um, Sally, I made her ask exactly the same question. She's like, how much should I tell the team? Because often the team members think I'll oh, revenue in, wow, they're making all that money and they don't realise the operational expenses and the cost of acquiring customers, the cost of product, the cost of everything else. So finding a metric that everybody can get behind mm. is the one you need to choose. And we're all in business to make a difference to other human beings. So when you attach that number to a human element, then it's exciting for people. So the other metric for the Red Balloon business, because it's a two-sided marketplace, is our supply community, our mm -hmm. experience suppliers. Yeah. So in the COVID year, we delivered 712,000 customers to experience suppliers, small businesses. Yeah. And in 2021, that's close to 1.2 million. And, and then people go, oh my goodness, we've made a material impact to the economic outcome of our community. You know? So they can attach to that. And I think that's really important. Yeah, and, and, having, and do you have different metrics for different customers? So in a two-sided or three-sided marketplace, do you have a different metric for both audiences or do you drive the business around one metric generally? No, I, um, I would have one, one metric that unites it's everything all encompassing. Yeah. because one drives the other. Yeah. I always say if you haven't got lollies on the shelf, you've got nothing to sell. That's the, that's the business of a two-sided marketplace. Yeah nothing to sell. Um, but we know for our job is to find customers for experience supplies. The job of sell is to find customers for her products. You know, that's actually our job. Mm. So that's what we want to celebrate, you know, whether it be veggie pod or it doesn't matter which one. And if there's not enough, they're not going to survive. Yeah. You know, it's always about how many customers, how they're talking about you, what do they think of you? And so it, well, it's something we're always thinking about is this customer obsession point and how we can really help businesses and empower them to grow anytime and anywhere. How do you see Ewolix helping, say, founders focus on that customer obsession piece? And maybe it's around different customers in different places and being able to serve that. How have you seen I, from your perspective? So I just get grumpy that such a product as Airwallex wasn't around 20 years ago. Because if I even think about how we pay our suppliers, like that's a lot of work for someone. And so it comes this point, and I, I remember it, and it would happen to so many founders, this moment where you go, oh my God, I've got so many customers. Now, what's going on with the money management? Where is it? And before you know it, you're having to have conversations with your bank and they may or may not understand your business or you're looking for how, how does this gateway serve me or how do I pay my suppliers? Or And in the case of Sell, for instance, you know, they're selling offshore. Like, so, oh, now we've got currency problems, all this sort of caper. And all of a sudden, they're no longer working on the things that we love to work on, which is customer. We're all of a sudden working on, on administration, which we have to have. You've yeah. got, you got to have it. But really, yeah. it's – and the cost of that. Because if you don't look at – I remember way back in the day, all of a sudden I realised how much I was paying in merchant fees. And when you're starting doing a million, two million, ten million, a hundred million, and you're looking at those fees – that's a lot of money yes. and it comes straight out of your margin and it's money you can't invest in growth. So, um, so for me, the notion of Airwallex is about freeing up time for founders to work on what their strength is, which is customer focused. I think that's an excellent place to leave off. It's been great to talk to you about customer obsession, Naomi, and how you think about it with the various businesses that you work with. I don't just think about it, I breathe it and you, I can't help it. I honestly can't help it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Naomi. My pleasure. <laughs>